Hello, everyone. Thank you for registering and joining the Advanced Coatings Research Webinar sponsored by Harkin Elmer. We have two esteemed speakers with us today. Steve Upstone is a field application scientist at Perkin Elmer. He has over 40 years experience as a subject matter expert in UV Viz NIR and fluorescence spectroscopy. He works in the EMEI region for Perkin Elmer, assisting in product development and applications. Peter Wan Nanaitan is the founder and R&D director of OMT Solutions, a company that is specialized in optical measurements and testing. Peter has a PhD in measurement and modeling of optical and thermal radiation properties. With more than 40 years of experience in applied physics and engineering, he leads a team of engineers and material scientists who collaborate with academic and industrial research institutes. I will now hand it over to Steve to start the presentation. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Van Carter. Okay, these are some of the application areas we're going to look at today. These are not the only application areas we deal with, but these are the major ones. So I put a list here. Um, so we're going to include topics such as optics, nanomaterials, photovoltaics, semiconductors, and then we're going to look at some of the uh, defense and displays applications, glass and coatings. So this is quite a different market from our traditional chemistry focused sort of instrumentation. Um, this is a very specialized market for us. This gives us some challenges um, because we have a range of samples that we, we have to deal with. Those samples could be very large or very small. They could also be very difficult to mount because they're regularly shaped or they, they are in a form that, that, that is, is, is difficult to measure. So that's, that's one challenge that we have to face. The second challenge is that we get a result on the instrument and maybe it's a material that's never been measured before. So it may, it, we may not know what the correct answer should be or what we're expecting. It may be that the results we get are, are different from what we expect. And then we have to try and understand why we are getting a difference between, for example, a measured sample and a, um, a, 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 a model that we've constructed. Then the samples, they may be very strongly absorbing. Um, again, with a liquid sample, we would have the ability to dilute a sample down, uh, but with a solid, we don't have that, uh, that luxury. Uh, or on the other hand, they, they may um, hardly absorb at all. So we have to, you know, we have to be able to uh, see if we can make a meaningful measurement out of something that, that, that barely absorbs. The samples may, of course, be opaque, so we have to use different strategies um, compared to using a sort of conventional measurement. So, to sort of slightly oversimplify things, there are really four scenarios um, that can happen with a sample. So, uh, in the top right-hand corner, we have normal transmittance. This is the, the most common type of measurement on a, on a lab uh, UV vis spectrometer, where the light passes cleanly through the sample and is detected. But we may also have the scenario which is, is we see on the bottom uh, right-hand corner, where the sample is actually scattering light. And what this means is that if we try and measure this on a, on a, a, a standard lab instrument, we will not capture everything that's coming through the sample because it's being scattered away from the detector. So we need a strategy to deal with that. On the other hand, the sample may not uh, transmit light at all, or it may do a mixture of both. So on the, on the left-hand side, at the top, we have specular reflectance. Specular coming from the Latin speculum, uh, which means it's mirror-like reflection. So angle of instance equals angle of reflectance. So it's a very predictable um, type of reflectance. 
On the other hand, we may have diffuse reflectance. This is the kind of reflectance that you would get from a paint, for example, um, or any other kind of cell, like a fabric or, or something like that, where the light is being diffused in all directions. Now, samples may be a mixture of all of these four different scenarios. So, you know, you may have, for example, glossy paper. So most of the light would be uh, diffuse reflectance, but there would be a specular component there as well. And, and, and so on and so forth. So, so, so you know, this is a, a simplification of, of, of what can happen. But, um, you, you know, there are, there are all kinds of uh, different scenarios. The next slide. So when we measure these materials, we have a number of possible measurement requirements. It's not just a question of putting the instrument, the, the sample in the instrument, pressing a button and getting the result. We have to work out what is required. So the first thing is we need to know is what measurement do we want to make? If the sample transmits light, do we want to measure the transmittance? Or do we want to measure the reflectance Obviously, if the sample is uh, is opaque, then we can only measure reflectance because light won't pass through. The second thing is, do we want to deal with the, the light scatter? So this could be because the sample is 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 of cloudy appearance, for example, um, or it may be due to some. When we say scatter, the scatter could be due to refraction. So when we, when we measure glass, we have to make sure that we we capture all the multiple internal reflections that we see in glass. And as we said earlier, then the samples could be specular, diffuse, or a mixture of both. So we need to understand which of these things we want to measure. The second thing, particularly with coatings and, and coated materials, and specular coatings in particular, is do we want to measure near normal incidence? In other words, uh, with the, the beam being as perpendicular as, to the sample as possible. Or do we want to vary the angles of incidence, um, which you abbreviated his AOI? Uh, samples where we have higher angles of incidence automatically uh, will become sensitive to polarization issues. So generally, with a, a, an AOI greater than 15 degrees, we can expect that polarization issues will start to play a part. We may have some samples that we need to measure under certain environmental conditions. So, for example, we may need to measure them at variable temperature, or we may need to measure them in some kind of inert atmosphere. Uh, so, so either sort of some some inert gas or in a vacuum. And of course, we we can expect some non-ideal behaviour. There are some cases, there are some things which can give us a, a result that we we, we don't expect. So, for example, if we're measuring uh, a coating, it may be that there is some fluorescence in there, or that the sample is not behaving in a in in one of the four scenarios that I presented earlier. Uh, for example, something like silicon can exhibit something called sparkle, which is a kind of uh, random sort of uh, type of reflectance. So, this is. Uh, the, the type of instrument we would do these perform these measurements on in the UV vis NIR, so the Lambda 1050 plus, and that covers a range from 175 to 3300. Little caveat on that: to work below 190, you would have to purge with nitrogen because the oxygen in the atmosphere starts to absorb. Uh, and um, the top limit is 3300 nanometers. Again, it will depend a little bit on what accessory you've got in the instrument as well. So, for example, if you use an integrating sphere, then the top limit would drop down to 2,500 nanometers. There are some users that are only really interested in the visible light, a UV visible range. So we have a version of the instrument called the Lambda 850 Plus, which has a top limit of 900 nanometers rather than 3,300 nanometers. So these are a very high quality instrument. Um, they have to be because if you want to measure uh, samples with very uh, high absorbance or a low transmittance, whichever you want to look at it, you need to uh, have very good, good linearity at, uh, at higher, higher absorbance values. And so what we use is two monochromators in series, so a double, uh, double beam, double monochromator system. 
For the near infrared, um, so this doesn't apply to the 850 plus because that's a UV vis only instrument. Then we have a uh, we have two choices: a, a two detector system, which is photomultiplier for the UV vis and lead sulfide for the whole of the NIR. Alternatively, we can use an additional indium gallium arsenide in gas detector. Um, um, so we use two detectors in the NIR. This is really for high sensitivity applications, particularly where you've got very low light levels um, or you're using things like apertures or lenses or whatever. The in-gas detector is very good at handling um, very low light levels. In fact, it's, it's kind of on a par with the PMT uh, for doing high absorbance work. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really nice detector. But the PBS is a, a very good lead sulfide, is a very good general purpose detector. So it really depends on the application. One of the key things we all see is that there are two, two sampling areas on the instrument. It's not very clear on this particular picture, but you'll see uh, in, a, in a few slides time, the fact that you've got two sampling areas. And we have sampling modules, and these are rapidly interchangeable, literally, um, you can change a module in about 10 seconds to reconfigure the instrument. It's not a hot swap, you just have to turn the instrument off and back on again. But, but it's very easy to change between modules. I don't want to steal too much of Peter's thunder because he's going to talk about the uh, TAM system. But this slide does show the, the two detector concept, uh, two, sorry, the two sample compartment uh, concept very nicely. Uh, this is an automated goniometer for measuring transmittance and reflectance at variable angles. And um, it has interchangeable detectors and there's an auto-sample option. But uh, as I say, I don't want to, uh, to uh, tread on Peter's toes, so to speak. Um, so I will uh, pass on that a little bit. Um, one of the things with the TAMs is there is a, a wafer holder. So if you're measuring uh, silicon, then there is a, a holder which is designed to measure 8-inch wafers at variable angle um, on, on the TAMs. We also have some other uh, reflectance accessories for measuring specular reflectance. So we have an accessory called the URA, Universal Reflectance Accessory. And again, this is another sampling module. So I've indicated it here with a square. Um, it works on a different principle to the TAMS. Um, it uses what we call the VN principle. Um, but where it has a really nice niche is measuring samples where a small beam is wide. Remember, we were talking about samples that uh, uh, may be very small. So this is really good for those samples. It's also good at measuring things like foils as well, because the sample is horizontally mounted rather than vertically mounted. So if the, if the sample's a bit floppy, um, it, it will tend to lay down much better uh, when, it, when it's horizontally mounted. So for those kinds of samples, it's, it's great. So this just shows that the spot, the spot size can be varied. Um, it uses the instrument slit and common beam settings to produce a, a beam size. Typically, we would probably use about four millimeter square. It, it, that would be our kind of go-to size. We can go smaller, but of course, the smaller you make the beam, the less likely you're leaving the sample. So it, it's always a trade-off. But um, if you have a really small sample, then that, that is something that could be necessary. So this is a little bit about how a VN accessory works. And this, we used to sell manual VN accessories. Um, and the thing is with the VN, it is a what we call an absolute accessory, as is the TAMS, which means we don't have to make a reference measurement using a known reflector. And particularly with variable angle measurements, that's really important because the thing is you would, either, you would have to get your reference material calibrated at a range of, of angles and polarization states, which would be very expensive. So if you can have an accessory which doesn't require um, uh, that then 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 that's that's great that's not to say that you can't use any of the accessories in relative mode 
uh, you always have the option of doing a comparative measurement, particularly for things like QC purposes. But, but it is really great to be able to make a, me a measurement without having to use a known reference. So the VN accessory, I won't go really too much through the, the optical diagram, but the point is the sample can stay in situ when we do the baseline measurement uh, because the, it is not in the beam path. So, that, so what it means is with the, with the URA, we can set up a list of angles that we want to measure and we don't have to move the sample each time. It's a really powerful thing. Accessory type is an integrating sphere module, and probably the one we sell most of is the 150 millimeter diameter integrating sphere. So uh, this is, I would say, pretty much an industry standard sphere. Most of the major glass companies use this uh, accessory, and it, 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 it's a very versatile accessory. Any kind of diffuse reflectance measurements. Having said that, it's also used very much in the glass industry as well. So although glass is a highly uh, specular sample, it is measured on an integrating sphere, mainly because of the internal reflectance, reflections that we, we uh, have to deal with. So where we, we can mount the sample on an integrating sphere in one of two positions. So if we look at the diagram on the uh, on, on, the, on the right hand side, the sample can either go in the light entrance port, in which case we would measure transmittance, and everything that's being scattered is now being detected. On the other hand, uh, we may want to put the sample at the back so that the sample, we then measure diffuse reflectance. So depending on the design of the sphere, we are able to measure either total reflectance or we can measure diffuse only. The other advantage with this class of instrument is we are able to use the reference beam uh, with both of these uh, um, in both these measurements. That's important because after the light goes through the sample or bounces off the sample the first time round, then the sample actually becomes part of the sphere wall and actually modifies it. So having a re reference beam inside the, uh, inside the sphere as well, which we're able to do on a chopper bay system because the beams are multiplexed, there's never light in both beams at the same time, uh, we, we are able to then account for that systematic error and we get much better accuracy. So we talk about the sphere as also being a hemispherical reflectance accessory. So on the left, you can see where we're coming from there. That's what we're basically mirroring. So the way an integrating sphere works is the, the light, if we look at reflectance, we have the sample on the right hand side and the light leaves the sample, zigzags around the sphere and then lands on the photo detector. So it's always an indirect measurement. So this is a slightly oversimplified diagram. There will usually be, baff there will be baffles inside the sphere because what we don't want is the sample to see the detector directly. It always has to be a, 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 an indirect measurement. And the other thing is it's important that the sphere is as highly reflective as possible because every time a photon hits the sphere wall, it's losing a bit of energy. So we use a proprietary material made by a company called LabSphere and it's called Spectralon. It's a white sintered PTFE and it has a reflectivity over the UV vis range generally, I'll well, say in the visible range, about 99%. So we'll make our, our losses are, are very low. And in the NIR, um, it, it is also very good because unlike barium sulfate, which is um, another material that can be used, uh, it doesn't absorb water. So with barium sulfate spheres, you do get areas of quite high noise due to the uh, due to water bands because uh, barium sulfate is quite hygroscopic. With the 150 millimeter sphere, it's big enough that we can put a, a we have the option of using a center mount. This is not such a commonly made measurement. Usually it's either transmittance or reflectance or both, but we do have the ability to suspend the sample in the, in the middle. The advantage there is we see scatter from all directions, we're capturing it. If we put it either in the reflectance position or the uh, transmit position, we're only seeing half the story. By putting the sample in the middle of the sphere, then we are able to uh, look at the total reflectance and we can vary the angle as well so we can tilt it if we want to. Uh, 
And when we look at the 150 millimeter sphere, um, we compare it with certified diffuse reflectance standards. Uh, you can see here that it is in very close agreement uh, with 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 these, these traceable standards. So it it, it is a, a go-to sphere for just about every kind of material. There are some exceptions that uh, Peter will talk about in his um, presentation about uh, regarding things like pattern glass, which are quite difficult materials to measure, but for other types of material, then the 150 millimeter sphere is is definitely the, the uh, an excellent choice. So I've got a few examples of measurements here that we've made um, on various uh, options, uh, accessory options. So when we look at optical components, these are typically say things like filters, either bandpass filters, or they may be cut off or cut on filters. Could be other components like beam splitters and uh, other such things. So if we want to characterize a bandpass interference filter, these are some of the things we might want to look at. Uh, we might want to look at uh, the highest transmittance, the center wavelength of that kind of envelope, the bandpass at half height, but probably the most difficult measurement is the outer band blocking. We want to make sure that the filter is blocking everything uh, from getting through. That's basically what you're paying the money for when you buy these filters. And so, uh, you know, some might block to three or four OD. OD or absorbance is the same thing, but optical index for OD. Um, or it could be they want to block, you know, six or seven uh, absorbance OD or OD. Um, this is a measurement I made on the TAMS between 350 and 2500 nanometers of a low reflector. This is an anti-reflection coating uh, measure, measured with S&P polarization using the sphere-based detector. When I talk, say sphere-based, it's not an integrated sphere, but it's one of the detector options that you have with the TAMS. Um, there are different detector sets we offer depending on the application. This is a, this is a nice slide. Um, this is a sample that was measured on the TAMS. Very, very sensitive to angle, angular positioning. So these are measured at 53, 55 and 57 degrees at S&P polarization. These are actually two measurements. We, take, we measured the sample once, took it out and then we put the sample back in again and remeasured it. What we do is we measure positive and negative angles and we take the take the average. By doing that, we correct for any minor positioning um, systematic errors, uh, which are nothing to do with the instrument, they just do with the positioning. And you can see we get really fantastic overlay uh, of the two sets of data by taking that approach. But again, I don't want to steal beta thunder too much. This is measuring a solar, uh, solar cell using the URA. So this is our typical small sample where we need a, 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 a small beam. So in this case, we used a three millimeter by three millimeter spot size. And again, we can just place it on top of the sample because the sample is horizontally mounted. Then uh, we don't have to worry about uh, making some kind of jig to position it. We can just put it on and measure it in situ. Next class of materials we look at are nanomaterials. This is a big area. Uh, really modern nanomaterials really started about 1985 um, with the late Harry Croto, who was actually my personal tutor at Sussex University. Back in there, well, I, I won't go into the, uh, the, the exact time. I would give my age away. Um, but yeah, Harry was a, a great guy and sadly no longer with us, but he was uh, one of the people behind the Buckminster Fullerenes, and you see where the, na the name comes from. It was an uh, uh, exhibit at an expo, um, which has the same kind of geodesic uh, structure. So this is one of, uh, this is quite an early measurement we made. This is carbon nanorods in toiling. It's actually a pretty horrible looking spectrum. Um, it won't win any 
prizes in a beauty contest, but actually uh, it's, it's very informative. Um, it's got these bumps, which are actually all useful information uh, that we can use to, uh, to characterise these materials. One of the things that uh, people want to do with these materials is to look at their semiconductor properties. And so what they do is they do a measure. They want to measure the difference in energy between the conduction band and the valence band. That's termed the band gap. So this is a semiconductor type measurement. And to do that, they need to take some measurements. Um, uh, usually this is done externally to taking the raw spectrum and transforming it. And then they produce what's called a talc plot. Uh, and then you draw a line at the slope and where it intersects the x-axis, you can then read off the, the band gap in electron volts. When you're measuring sort of small amounts of powder, then that's quite difficult on uh, an integrating sphere because you need quite a, you know, relatively more material. So there is a strategy or an accessory that we can use. Um, a company called Harrick produce uh, the Praying Mantis accessory. And this is a diffuse reflected accessory, which they also sell for FDIR applications as well. Um, but it can be adapted to be used with the UV vis NIR instrument. So what's going on inside is basically it's a system of mirrors which focuses the beam. It's really a bit like a beam condenser. And you can either have uh, just cups mounting the sample, a big cup or a small cup, or you can have a reaction chamber which you can either uh, heat, or there is a cooled version as well, or you can work with an inert atmosphere. So you could work under argon or under vacuum. Uh, and that can go with the under vacuum, it can go up to just over 900 degrees C. So it does give you the ability to do variable temperature measurements as well. And this is uh, a catalyst that has been measured. The red line is uh, at 90 degrees. The black line is the same material at room temperature. So you get quite a different uh, spectrum uh, by, by changing the temperature. So this this information this was collected at Queen's University in Belfast um, some years ago, and and it's uh, uh, they use the praying mantis with with our instrument. Another area we where we get involved is uh, solar reflecting materials, particularly with things like paints. Um, there is interest now in producing paints for buildings, which reflect in the near infrared uh, because that then reflects heat. So what you can see here is the three spectra. Uh, the, the red spectrum is the, so, the sun's output. So this, this is a solar table taken from ASTM G173. So this is just a standard solar output table. And you can see the visible region, the other two spectra are identical that's because in the colored region, uh, you want to have the same colour, uh, but in the near infrared, so really everything above about 800 nanometers, you can see one of them, the darker of the two lines, has much higher uh, reflectivity compared to the, 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 the lighter of the two lines. Uh, and this is so that the, the, the paint will reflect more heat. And so this has a benefit in lowering air conditioning costs because if you're reflecting more heat, then you're not building it up. And so there's an energy saving. And so this is a good example of a sort of high value added product because there's a clear benefit to the customer, the end customer, uh, when using this, these, these kind of materials. So there's a lot of interest in this, this type of material. Okay, just looking at uh, uh, the FTIR world for a minute, because we've been talking about UV vis NIR, but there are optical companies companies, for example, that want to measure optical components in the mid-infrared. So we do a special version of the Spectrum 3 Optica, particularly for optical applications. And we, to do that, we need to use a, a modified instrument, which has got, um, I mean, the, what we really need is very accurate Y-axis or transmittance accuracy. So to do that, we need to put baffling into the instrument and some off-act 
axis optics. What we don't want is, I mean, some of these materials have a very strong back reflection. If that back reflection goes into the interferometer, that's going to give you a, a double modulation issues. So we have to add, add additional baffling to deal with that. We also use a very linear detector, which is lithium tantalate, uh, as opposed to the normal DGTS detector. Um, this, this has uh, better linearity. And of course, if you want very good y-axis uh, accuracy, that is impor important. The bulk of the NR, uh, FTIR market is to do with identification. So the y-axis accuracy is, is less important. But when we're looking at transmittance of filters, then of course it's a, a very big, big deal. And we specify, it can measure outside the range, but 2 to 25 microns, so 2,000 to 25,000 nanometer range. Um, it can measure outside the range, but that's where we, we spec it. And this is uh, some, some data we generated on germanium. Um, measured on Spectrum 3 Optica versus uh, a NIST reference instrument. We get very, very, very good agreement uh, on both systems. So uh, that's, uh, that's really the proof of what we're doing. And then my final slide before I hand over to Peter is we have an IR wafer mapping system for people looking at semiconductors who maybe want to look at organic impurities, that kind of thing. It's a mapping system called MAP-IR. And uh, it's, it's available in two versions, either for 8 or 12 inch wafers. And it's based on the Spectrum 3, and it's for mapping wafers. So uh, this is a, a, a application area that uh, we, 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 we are also involved in. OK, I'm now going to hand over to my friend and colleague, uh, Peter Van Nijnarten, who I've known for many years. Um, he's uh, uh, a very, very knowledgeable guy. Um, yeah, uh, I'm very pleased to hand over to him. So, uh, Peter, I'm just going to put your first slide up here. I'm just going to, yes. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, I'll be back to talk to you in the Q&A. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Steve. Um, so my presentation is mostly on uh, the tools for optical materials characterization. So basically, I'm continuing with uh, with the to some of the topics uh, which Steve already mentioned, and uh, in my case, the um, uh, the main topics will be uh, scattering and BRDF. So the angle resolved scattering measurements is uh, something which is uh, becoming more and more important uh, now nowadays. It's uh, used for a lot of um, uh, modeling and um, uh, uh, of different types of materials, which used in LEDs, LEDs, in uh, screens, in all sorts of applications. Um, and uh, we have a lot of uh, very nice, interesting tools for that. And the last couple of years, we've been specializing in doing those measurements as accurately as possible. Um, um, probably over about 35 years ago, I, I started uh, uh, developing tools for spectrophotometers, mostly the programmer ones, uh, for angular-dependent reflection and transmittance um, measurements. Um, so we're going to discuss uh, actually the more modern um, results of that, and we will also uh, do some of the um, discuss some of the infrared applications. Um, since about uh, 2000, we have automated uh, measurements. So we uh, developed, we started developing a uh, so-called ARTA, an automated reflection transmittance analyzer, uh, with which you can do angular resolved scattering measurements and also um, measurements of reflectance at different angles of incidence and also transmittance. So it's, um, it's a tool which uh, is still one of the most accurate tools we have for this purpose. Um, it has a relatively small sample compartment. It's the one which is on the top. It's a sort of the, the newer model since 2007 has a sort of cylindrical compartment which is accept accessible from the top. So um, since 2015, we uh, have actually uh, another accessory, which is the TOMS unit, which already mentioned by Steve. And the reason for this development was to uh, get something which is more affordable compared to the ARTA, because the ARTA is extremely accurate 
uh, for its purpose, but it's also quite expensive and also not that flexible. Uh, with the TOMS, we have more flexibility. Uh, we have a larger platform. Uh, for instance, we can have larger samples. For the ARTA, it's limited to about 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters square, like four inch square samples. And here we have uh, 20 centimeters square samples, which is a possibility still with, uh, with the TOM. So we more or less uh, increase the size of the sample compartment, but also have more flexibility. For instance, here we can exchange detector units. The ARTA has a fixed sphere detector. I will explain a little bit uh, why that is in the next slide, but uh, in, the, um, in the type of measurement uh, depends, uh, determines the type of detector you need. For instance, for scattering measurements, you want more sensitivity. So a direct detector is more useful. Whereas for um, coating measurements, if, if it comes to reflection and transmittance at different angles of incidence, you need a so-called sphere detector um, to reduce systematic errors. And um, unfortunately, the disadvantage of spheres is that you lose energy. You uh, uh, end up measuring only a fraction of the original energy. So uh, it's not the most sensitive. It is the most accurate way of doing those type of measurements. Um, this is uh, basically shown here. If you have um, sphere detectors, you will be able to cover, uh, to, to, uh, to get all the uh, multiple beams coming out of your sample at oblique incidence. And this is showing that um, in, in the photograph uh, where you see the, the multiple beams next to each other, that's actually the fold of the detector. That's a 30 millimeters by 12 millimeter high port of the ARTA detector. And with a sample, um, a six, uh, seven millimeter glass sample, which was um, illuminated at uh, 60 degrees incidence, using S polarized light and there is, uh, the, the coating is on the back and that means that uh, actually the, sec the first reflection R0 is from the full surface of the glass. The second one is more bright because it's from, from the coating which is more reflective and then you have either also multiple reflections from that and you have the same thing in transmitters. And what this picture shows you is that it clearly illustrates that you need a very large detecting surface and need a large uniform detector so regular detectors are not useful for that. But integrating spheres, you can connect that to a normal detector and you can have a, a rectangular entrance port for those beams. So this is basically the solutions we have for that. And also the TOMS uh, unit has the same type of detector. Um, another uh, option with our TOMS unit is uh, uh, option with our TOMS unit is uh, an auto sampler. So you can, for instance, you could do measurements at different angle of incidence in reflection and transmittance and reflection both sides of the sample in one automated run. But you can also put many samples in an auto sampler uh, like this one. It has, uh, this has a, a, a sample plate which can be exchanged for one with, which can handle two inch samples. So these are, uh, this is a sample plate with one inch samples. And we can also put a six inch wafer there for mapping. So that's also a possibility. Um, one of the um, uh, purpose of doing angular measurements, completely automated, uh, preferably with a regular detector, uh, that is angular soft scattering. And since um, about, uh, I believe it was 2008, 2007, there was an increase in uh, demand from research groups which were focusing on uh, texturing transparent conductive oxides for solar cells with a, uh, uh, purpose to, uh, have more light coupling. So, so it's a light management thing in solar cells. And they, uh, the idea was if you have an etched surface, you can get more light coupled into the solar cell. So that's, uh, what they are investigating and, and they use scattering measurements to determine the topology of the surface and to determine the actually optical effects. Um, these were measurements which are still made using the ARTA because uh, at that time that was uh, the, uh, a tool which was uh, available for that. Uh, at the moment, uh, the, um, um, the TOMS is more flexible and also more sensitive to do those measurements because with the TOMS you can put a direct detector in there as well. Um, so... Uh, to give you an example, this is actually not so much a TOMS unit, these pictures, it's more 
an XL TAMS, we call it. It's a, it has the same TAMS platform. It's also connected to a LABA 1050, but it has a very large sample chamber. It's actually outside the instrument, coupled to the instrument. But it basically works the same as with the TAMS. So we can put the diffuser, uh, if you want to characterize the diffuser material there, we can put it on the rotating platform. And we can have an, uh, the detector unit with an aperture, because the aperture uh, uh, that determines the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, cone angle of the, uh, the detector, so the solid angle of detection, basically. And that is necessary to do an, uh, a real absolute measurement. So um, the definition of bidirectional reflection distribution function, the BRDF, and the same is for transmittance, for BTDF, uh, is basically uh, the formula you see here. And using this definition, using this type of measurement, you end up with um, a value which is um, truly instrument independent. So if you have another instrument which is different, uh, where the, the distance to your detector is different, or the size of the detector aperture is different, you can end up with the same results because the solid angle, that's omega in the formula, is already in there. It's completely cancelled out. So what you need to measure then is the, the power of the energy in the beam uh, without a sample, so the direct uh, beam, and also the power which under a certain angle of detection, the theta sub s, is measured by the detector. Uh, so this is basically the, the formula you need uh, and the type of measurement you need for doing uh, actual BRDF measurements. Uh, an example for the ARTA uh, is uh, this. Uh, unfortunately for the ARTA, the distance between sample and detector aperture, which is in this case a rectangular one, but we can put a an aperture plate in front of that uh, with a round circular aperture. Um, the distance is only uh, 10 centimeters, so about actually less, it's 92 millimeters to be exact, uh, so less than four inches. And it means that uh, the uh, placement error of the sample, but also the beam non-uniformity, results in fairly large systematic errors. So the accuracy of doing a BRDF measurement with an ARTA, uh, which can only... Uh, which is only possible if the sample has enough uh, scattering so that you have enough sensitivity for that. Uh, the accuracy is in the order of uh, three to five percent in um, in terms of uh, one standard uncertainty. So that's uh, uh, actually, if you do a two sigma, it's actually double the value. So it's um, it's a fairly repeatable value. Um, you can do measurements uh, using the ARTA with that uh, system uh, of BRDF, but the problem is the accuracy is not so high. Uh, basically. With the TAMS, is not so much better because the distance is also fairly short. But um, we found a way to uh, actually increase that uh, by uh, using um, a reference material, which we could characterize very accurately, and make a relative measurements of BRDF. So you basically calibrate your scale using a sample with a well-known BRDF. Usually that's a spectral sample, by the way, which is um, very high reflection, but also have a well-known and an almost Lambertian, but not entirely uh, reflection. Uh, we can measure the BRDF quite accurately with a much larger equipment. It's very time consuming, but then use those standards to do uh, BRDF measurements on the ARTA or the TAMS. This is on the TAMS where we had um, different detector apertures. We could uh, change the detector aperture. And this is to illustrate that no matter which aperture you take, the long, as long as you take the same aperture, uh, so the same cone angle of your, uh, the solid angle of your detector for uh, both reference sample and your unknown sample, then you get uh, basically the same value. So that uh, is an illustration of this principle. Um, and this is basically the curve we have for our sample, well, our reference sample, and we use the 0, 0,45 degree uh, measurements, which we really put a lot of effort in to get that data. And that has a combined standard uncertainty uh, with all the uh, repeatability and systematic errors uh, combined of uh, better than 0.6% uh, over this particular range. So that helps us to do uh, very accurate relative measurements. Um, another tool we actually have 
developed for um, this type of measurement is a very simple tool and it can only do 0.45 or 45.0 measurements. Uh, originally, the idea was to uh, use that for color measurements. There is a color standard which um, uh, defines color for zero incidence and 45 degree observ uh, observation. And um, uh, also uses a very wide diffusive standard as a sort of reference. But we found out you could do actually quite good um, BRDF measurements for this particular two angular configurations, especially the 0.45. Um, so this is an example, for instance. So it's it, uh, um, much more affordable than, for instance, an angular goniometer. It doesn't need to be automated. You can just put it in the sample compartment of a, a lab 1050, and you can directly measure the 0.45 diffuse reflection. And since it is a relative measurement with a calibrated standard, you can uh, use it for directly for BRDF measurements. So, for instance, you can see here uh, some examples. Uh, another spectrum sample. Um, we see the white ceramic tile, uh, which is a reference sample made by NIST in the 1980s. We still have one, um, which is a fairly, uh, fairly constant for material like that. Um, BRDF over the whole range, and it's also because the, it follows a bit the reflection of that material. Um, materials like white opal glass have a more, um, uh, it, it's not a really flat BRDF over the spectrum, it's more uh, wavelength dependent. Um, there are also some materials which you can easily measure here. It's, it's like the very black absorbing materials like uh, Acta black tape, which is a material which is used for stray light. Uh, prevention really to have a black surface, but it still has some reflection and also has a, still a measurable BRDF. It's diffuse black. So that's the blue curve actually where you see here. It can be measured quite well with this uh, system. And also we have the black felt, the green curve, which looks very black in the visible range, but as you can see, it's fairly high reflective still in the near infrared. So these are the, uh, some of the BRDF measurements. We also, uh, to go back to the still diffuse materials, uh, but more like integrating sphere measurements, which were also discussed by, um, uh, by Steve. Uh, we wanted to have a device where we could do angular measurements on diffuse materials. With uh, the TOMS unit and with ARTA, you can do specular measurements very well. If you have diffuse, diffuse samples, you can do BRDF and scattering measurements, but you cannot do angular transmitters or reflection on those samples if they are diffuse or patterned. So we developed actually a large integrated sphere accessory for that. We found that uh, for uh, good, very accurate uh, transmitters measurements of diffuse samples, we need at least um, a 270 millimeter sphere with a 100 millimeter port um, to um, cope with all sorts of effects, which I'm not going to discuss now, it will take too much time. But uh, anyways, we have developed a tool which can cope with that, can do reflection and transmit at different angles of incidence, and it's also, like most of these tools, are completely automated. So um, one example here is, um, uh, you can see how it works in transmittance. Uh, there's a, the left, the photograph, you can see there's the sample there. It's basically uh, solar cell cover glass. It's the pyramid shape, so it has a structure on it. It's a pattern glass, and you can see systematically how the beam is transmitted there, and the sphere behind it, the sample will capture that and measure it. Uh, it is um, still a double beam system because uh, you can see on top of the uh, uh, the picture, the cut picture, you see actually a, a gray uh, bundle, which is a fiber bundle. It connects the reference beam to the integrating sphere when it's still turning. So with different angles of incidence, you can still have the reference signal. And what is more, this is transmitted, but you can also do reflection. I just give you one angle for each. Uh, for instance, here we have, I believe it's 60 degrees incidence in reflection. Obviously, with reflection, you have to make sure that the beam comes from the back of the sample inside the sphere. So you need an opening in the sphere. And in order to cope with different uh, angles of incidence in the reflection, we had to make a sphere which with a whole series of ports, which also automatically open and close depending on which angles. 
And some of the angles we need to open two ports because the beam will be exactly in the, in the middle of the two. So um, the system we developed is basically uh, completely automated and the ports which needs to be opened is also automated in the system. So you basically put in the table of uh, angles for which we need reflection, a table of angles for the transmittance. There's also one particular uh, situation for haze measurement and then it will do all the measurements automatically for you. Uh, one of the projects we had um, uh, last year is, uh, and where we used this equipment, is a project for um, a building integrated uh, photovoltaics where we needed to determine uh, the properties, optical properties of colored and patterned uh, cover glass. Uh, colored cover glass is, uh, um, uh, was uh, part of the project because the idea was to give Architects, uh, architects, a reason to implement solar panels on um, on buildings which have a certain nice feature, like a nice color or a nice texture, uh, which uh, um, gives the architect uh, a reason to to use that, not just a black uh, solar panel. Um, so we uh, we measured all these materials, and I just give one example uh, of the curve. This is the diffuse green one. So uh, basically, uh, here we needed to do reflection, mainly, uh, not smart. We did transmitters also, but I just put one curve in on the right. Uh, so these are different angles of incidence. Um, and you see that only at the 75 degrees you have a high reflection. Uh, for all the other angles, the, the reflection stays fairly similar, fairly the same. Um, the left curve is, by the way, an example of a... Um, uh, that's actually um, uh, a window glass, but not, not just a, a window, not a clear window. It has a, it's a laminated glass with laminated with a, uh, a diffuse PVB foil, and this is used in rooftops of uh, like shopping malls to make sure that light is coming in, but you do not want the direct sunlight uh, coming in. And uh, obviously, um, in order to calculate what is the cooling necessary for uh, a hall like that or, or a building, you need optical properties in the solar range and this is what, uh, what we can measure with this system, both reflectance and transmittance at different angles of incidence. Um, another tool for angular measurements, we still, because this is one of the things which we uh, still do uh, uh, best and we are, uh, my company is quite unique at that, is angular measurements also in the infrared. So uh, after we already had a TOMS uh, mechanical platform, we decided to use the same type of platform for the infrared. So we built a goniometry system for angular transmitters and reflectance. Um, we will try to see if we can use it also for scattering measurements, but it's, that's more difficult in the infrared. We still need to test that. So we do have two different types of detector modules for this as well. And um, um, it is connected to a program of Spectrum 3 uh, Fourier transform spectrometer, like the one you already saw in one of Steve's slides. So it has a built-in polarizer drive because angular measurements of transmitters and reflection on most materials, they depend on the polarization. So we have a built-in polarizer drive as well in the optics, so the optical interface. That's actually the area between the, the actual goniometer and the instrument. It's connected to the goniometer, though it's just one package. Um, and um, uh, also, we have a possibility to choose at this moment two different types of detectors. We have a direct DTGS detector, which is uh, quite sensitive, but uh, it covers uh, 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 even a larger range than the current instrument does with a normal B splitter. With an MCD sphere detector, we have with an MCT sphere uh, with MCT detector we have more sensitivity because it's a liquid nitrogen cooled detector. And we need a detector with an indicating sphere because we use a small gold sphere as a detector sphere. So we, we can again cope with systematic errors, um, having got some of thicker samples doing that accurately on different angles of incidence. Um, this is how the platform looks. Uh, if you remove the cover, uh, you, this is what you see. There are some electronics which you cannot see behind the, um, uh, the vertical black uh, uh, metal plates in the back. And all the optics for making the beam is uh, between the actual instrument is on the left side, all gold mirrors, and also there's the polarizer drive there as well. Um, 
Um, so this is how the uh, system works with reflection. It actually, you can go also the other side, so you can, so you can do positive and negative angles. Um, enough for uh, angular measurements at the moment. I will continue with, uh, with some infrared applications as well, some other types of applications which we have for the same instrument uh, I'd like to show you. And one of them is uh, basically a customized system because we do a lot of customized projects for mainly for research institutes and universities. This is an example of that. Uh, one of the Dutch universities, and it's actually the this is the third time we made that. We also did it for a university in France and in Belgium. Uh, we built a system connected to an infrared uh, Fourier transform uh, spectrophotometer to determine infrared absorption uh, in um, actually in the in a plasma in a uh, plasma reactor. So you, uh, the purpose here for the customer was to determine the um, uh, the, the components the. Uh, the concentration of, of specific species in the gas, gas species in the in the plasma reactor. And in order to do that accurately, you need um, uh, many passes through this plasma. Actually, this has a total of 26 passes. So in the in this chamber, we have, uh, you see, there's a, uh, there's a, a long uh, horizontal tube on both ends of the tube. The plasma is in the center, both ends you have sets of mirrors and the beam is going back and forth through the mirrors. Uh, actually, it enters uh, the, the, the font in the center and then goes back and forth until it hits the last mirror in total 13. And then goes back into the same direction, back again, uh, back to in the, in the instrument where uh, the, the incoming and the returning beam is separated by a beam split and it goes into the detector for measurement. Um, other measurements in the infrared, uh, that's uh, with you know, this external drift accessory which we built for the synchrotron facility in uh, Grenoble in France. And that's actually um, uh, drift, that's a diffuse reflectance uh, infrared uh, Fourier transform uh, spectrometer accessory. Um, and that basically has uh, makes, uh, uses the beam, uh, external beam of the instrument to make a one millimeter spot size on the sample, there's a small reactor there and it's actually uh, used in Grenoble uh, for doing um, um, high temperature uh, reactions on cath uh, catalyzers. And um, uh, actually there is this plastic box, you see that the polyacrylate box has two holes at the height of the spot size and that's actually where the synchrotron beam is passing. Uh, they put small, um, uh, what do you call it, um, carbon uh, windows there, and uh, the beam is actually passing the carbon windows. And uh, so it's a multiple measurement on one specific, specific sample. Um, another infrared measurement is, uh, again, we're using integrated spheres. We do have integrated spheres for diffuse measurements as well, for uh, specular samples but also uh, with specular, usually they are slightly curved in this case, but also diffuse, real diffuse materials in the infrared. So with the, the, the usable wavelength is 2 to 20 microns. And with this system, you can also do curved samples. The only um, condition is that you also have curved references. So that we found that that's the way to really do accurate measurements on either curved lenses or cylindrical shaped materials like uh, the one in the photographs. And the way we can do really accurate measurement is that uh, is because of the design of our sphere, it's a gold sphere, which has a gold mirror um, in the wall of the, it's integrated in the wall. And that gold mirror is to focus the beam onto the sample. And uh, actually if you tilt, slightly tilt this mirror, which is part of the sphere wall, it has the same reflection, but it's specular instead of diffuse, uh, you can um, uh, get the beam onto the wall and that's basically your reference measurement. So it's a kind of pseudo double beam system, um, which is quite uh, common to use in infrared spheres as well. Um, but um, the unique part of our sphere is that we put the, the mirror for that, we put it in the wall. Uh, whereas uh, most of the current designs, they put a mirror in the center of the sphere because that's mechanically very easy to do, but also it uh, gives a lot of issues. You get a lot of artifacts by putting something in the center of the sphere. Some, uh, you get back reflectance from that mirror to, uh, 
from the edges of the mirror to your sample and, and otherwise, and usually you never get really accurate results from that. Um, we go back to UV-Vis now with, uh, with uh, some of the last examples. Uh, this is uh, again a heating, uh, an integrated sphere. This is a 150 millimeter sphere and it actually has a, an upward looking uh, 150 millimeter sphere where you have a sample holder which can heat up the sample. We can heat up the sample to about 300, even more degrees, but uh, above 300 degrees there usually are some issues with the infrared detector, so we use in-gas detectors there as well, uh, the photomultiplier and the in-gas detector, and that starts to become sens too sensitive for the infrared radiation, so it's usable up to about 300 degrees. And this is just an example uh, of measurements on uh, different materials, on, on one material at different uh, temperatures. Um, another um, uh, interesting accessory we have is a so-called microscope accessory, which can be used for really very, very small spot size. And we have used it in the past as a microscope accessory. And uh, it, uh, you can put an uh, or a cryogenic stage there, but you can also have a, a Lincoln stage, which can heat up the temp up to about 600 degrees. This particular measurement uh, was done in the uh, in used university in Paris and uh, on inclusions, gaseous inclusions, which are uh, inside vul uh, volcanic glasses. Um, so that's a very small spot size used for uh, doing this type of measurement at different temperatures. Um, I have two slides more. Uh, one is the is this one. It's another U150 millimeter sphere, which is as uh, for measurement modes. We can do the. Uh, the, actually the total transmittance, so uh, direct and diffuse included, but we can also do only the diffuse by uh, really uh, getting rid of the um, uh, direct transmittance by putting it in the light trap. So the, in the bottom you see the light, uh, the system, uh, the picture with the light trap. The same with reflection, we can do total reflection uh, at, by the way, the same angle of instance, we use the same 8 degree angle instance for transmitters and reflectance. So you can actually calculate absorption from that. And we use the, um, uh, we can also do trans uh, diffuse trans uh, reflection only by excluding the direct specular beam into a light trap. And for the same system, we also have optional sample holders for temperature control from uh, even from minus 20 Celsius to, 120, uh, to 120. And that is used for um, uh, thermochromic uh, materials. So uh, my last slide, I just want you also to show you an example that it is also possible to have accessories for extremely large samples like um, um, complete windscreens of cars or top uh, top windows of, of cars, uh, rooftop windows, and this is, uh, uh, and they can be measured without cutting smaller samples from it in reflection and transmittance. So this was my last uh, last slide. So I thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Peter. That concludes our presentation. We will now open the floor to take some questions from the audience. Thank you.